We literally have the best set of laws in the entire world right now for surrogacy. Family law and estate planning go hand in hand. I see very few businesses planning for it. Hello, I'm Brian Loy of Sage Financial Advisors with another episode of Sage Advice. Uh, we're a local wealth advisory firm with a simple goal of helping people um, secure their future wisely. And Sage Advice is a series of conversations that we've been having with very interesting people with interesting stories to help you think differently about your financial futures. Today joining us is Kim Surratt. Um, she's known regionally for her family law and the many facets of that, but also for her groundbreaking work with um, the LBGT family law area. And she's a remarkable professional. She's very passionate what she does, and we're thrilled to have her. So thanks for joining us, Kim. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, super. When Stephanie Cruz says to jump, I say <laughs> how high. Anyway, she said we really want to include you. Um, anyway, I was watching, I was on your website and saw this, your new video called Family Matters. And maybe just as an introduction, can you tell us about yourself, what inspired you to start your firm and, and an overview of your firm, recognizing that we'll get into the details as we go on with this conversation. Sure. Well, I appreciate you pointing out the video. It's always a lot of work to have to do marketing stuff like that. When you get recognized, you're excited about it. But Family Matters, yeah, it, it, that's the logo. That's our, um, our catchphrase for our office. We couldn't figure out the best way to describe what we do um, without just saying it's everything having to do with Family Matters. Um, part of that is because we were doing not just divorce work, not your typical family law, but also family formation, reproductive law, estate planning, guardianships, anything that affects your family, literally from, for, from birth to grave, uh, we're participating in it. We look at ourselves as being very holistic. And uh, I'm proud of my firm. We started in 07. We're still going strong. I've had very, very little turnover of staff and those that I have have had very legitimate reasons and are no longer with us, but uh, we, uh, we're a family and we, we appreciate our clientele the same way we appreciate, it, appreciate each other at least. How did you, what, what inspired you to get into this business and attract this family that you work with now? Uh, you know, my undergrad was in sociology and psychology. I did come out of law school swearing off family law, saying I would never touch it. I went into insurance defense. And then when I realized I had one more person suing a company for a drink they spilled on the floor and slipped on on themselves, uh, I was just going to lose my mind. I couldn't, I couldn't understand the motivations there and what drives people. But in family law, I could understand people better. I realized my sociology, psychology background was more important than I thought it was. I was just going to come out being a big corporate lawyer when I came out of law school, but then I realized people are really my thing, not companies. Wow. Well, uh, uh, um, that's a worthy investment of your, of, of your college degree. Way to go. Okay. It feels good. We've had a lot of uh, yeah, successes over the years, a lot of things that I've done and I've participated in and volunteered with. I'm proud of it. Super, super. Well, Kim, I'm familiar with different parts of law, uh, maybe the estate planning side. I need to go, I'm, I'm going to buy a piece of property. So I get some business transaction lawyers involved. God forbid I get into dispute. Um, can you tell me about the different areas of law that you work in and how they interrelate? Sure. I, the whole reason we brought estate planning into our firm was because of that, again, that holistic approach. So uh, whether I'm doing a surrogacy for somebody or an adoption for somebody and they're adding a child into their family, uh, at that stage, the conversation with that family is, have you provided for that child if something happens to you? Is that child going to have a guardian? Uh, is the money stabilized and segregated for that child? Have you taken care of them or not? Uh, you move on to the divorce world and the custody world and you know you, you get divorced. You don't want your, your ex to necessarily receive everything that uh, you have if you pass away. Uh, even if it goes to your child, you know, you got to designate a guardian, but 
divorce is another extremely important time in everybody's life to look at their finances and say, well, wait a minute, am I protected for the future? Most people going into a marriage thinking they're gonna have a team for retirement, two of them. And when you come out of a divorce, it's now half of what you had and probably not what you planned for. Then we move on to, to the elderly. A lot of our guardianship clients, uh, as people age, they need help and they need somebody to assist them in making their financial or their medical decisions. Uh, we, we work with a lot of, uh, a lot of elderly, there's a lot of dementia in our society nowadays. And I think us, the, the fact that we're family law attorneys and we've dealt with every emotion on the planet makes us a little better suited to help with all those stages of life. And, you know, if, if, if it's a super high net worth uh, estate plan, now we may not be the best suited for those people. I mean, we're honest with our clients about what we can do or what we should do, but family dynamics how you get along with your relatives, whether they hate you from the grave or not is something that we specialize in and we can really help people with those personality flaws. Wow, well, I think maintaining harmony in the family is probably paramount for all of our considerations, but like you were just mentioning, I mean, there's all these unexpected things that happen, which- Yeah, if I had a dime for every time somebody told me, oh, not my family, my family would never fight. This was, this will never be an issue. Yeah. It fails. <laughs> you have then. Yeah. Well, death causes a lot of family dynamics that people don't expect. They think they'll get along with their siblings really, really well. Oh, we'll just divide it up. We'll make it work. But money makes people greedy. Death makes people emotional. It's never what people think it's going to be. Planning's much more advisable. Okay. Well, I mean, that was another question was um, for people who say it'll never happen to me, death's a good example. Um, why I would never need some kind of lawyer, a family law expert. What are some of the other areas? You said you mentioned divorce. You mentioned maybe dementia or, or, or uh, elder care. Um, cancer, you know, we get a lot of people in now uh, doing a lot of planning because, uh, well, they're going through cancer treatment and their lifespan's not what they thought. You know, we get a lot of emergency estate plans, especially with COVID. Um, I think everybody's seeing their life flash behind, <laughs> before their eyes and they're thinking about death in a different way in this past year than they ever have. And uh, it's Planning's always a good idea. It doesn't matter if you're at a divorce stage or you're adopting. We talked about that. You know, if you're bringing a new child into your family or a child into your family for the first time, uh, you got to plan for those children. They deserve for you to plan for them. We don't, you know, there's a lot of planning that happens through a divorce because now everybody thinks about custody schedules, who's going to be with the child when, but uh, you got to think about when, what if you die too? It's more than just if you divorce. Okay. Well then, Kim, what other ways might people plan for these changes or transitions in life where they might need a consultation with an expert such as yourself, whether it be family formation or counseling? What else can we do? Well, you know, I reach out, you know, so many people put this off. I'll tell you, lawyers are one of the worst. It's like uh, shoemaker's <laughs> son, right? Having right. <laughs> shoes with holes. I mean, it's lawyers are some of the worst. Doctors are some of the worst. They put it off. They put it off. Um, they have significant amount of income, but they aren't planning and planning's critical. I mean, I, I, we send people constantly to uh, individuals like yourself. I mean, it's, it's bigger than just planning for your death. It's planning for your incapacitation. If you become disabled, you can't work. Uh, you know, you need to know who's going to help make your financial decisions, who's going to make your medical decisions. You know, a lot of people, when they get divorced, they don't think about doing a new estate plan. They always had their spouse was going to be the person to do those things for them. And, you know, now that they're divorced and I look at them, look at them and I say, Okay, so your mom's next in line, right? Well, I don't want my mom making my medical decisions. <laughs> well, then you need to designate somebody. We need to figure that out. Because we're not just planning for death, we're planning for incapacitation also. Wow, very good. 
Well, you mentioned you, t you started this off about procrastination of about the shoemakers, right? The shoemakers. Yeah. Story. I remember a picture of Melvin Belli. I think it was back in the 80s. And one of his Rolls Royces was like up against 45 degrees up against a telephone pole because I think it was his sixth, seventh or eighth divorce or something like that. He was <laughs> and drove off the road in San Francisco. So I get that. Yeah. I well, and a lot of those people, you know, what you when you have had multiple divorces and you've divided your income multiple times, you know, you start to think, well, I don't have money to plan for my estate plan, but uh, it, it's it's critical. You know, I always tell people, well, how much do you hate your heirs? Do you really want the people that you leave behind to have to work that much harder? Because we could we could make it easier on them. Hmm. Okay. Well, you know, you mentioned about um, professionals and, and mentioned about heirs, how to protect heirs. Just two questions on that. Um, how do you, you know, what other professionals do you recommend your clients get involved with when there's a major life change? And then second of all, how do you work with other professionals? Well, we work with financial advisors a lot. A lot of their clients are coming into our office because um, financial advisors give the same advice we do, which is you need to plan. You need to know who your beneficiaries are. You need to know who's taking care of you. So we work with financial advisors a lot. We work with real estate agents a lot. Um, you know, in terms of family dynamics, if there's family infighting, um, we work with counselors a lot, uh, mediators to sit and iron out these problems. Uh, you know, what happens is mom ends up on life support mom never did a power of attorney for herself and the siblings are fighting and mom's in the hospital and decisions need to be made and no one can agree i mean that's those are critical times for us to work with mental health professionals to work with these individuals and iron out the problems um but you know is it, it does it have to be complicated no i don't know what size of a state of person i'm talking to right so if it's uh, complicated estates with lots of businesses well then we got a lot more work to do we might need to speak to an attorney who specializes in business formation uh, everybody should plan not just for their own personal finances but if you have business partners and you own a business with somebody else uh, the succession planning is important there too i mean it's almost an estate plan to decide what happens if one of the partners passes away yeah, I mean, death, it can, it's kind of like a disillusion or a, a divorce with the business, right? Kind of issue. I see very few businesses planning for it, which is, which is interesting, right? Because a lot of businesses have two key professionals or two key partners. Uh, and if one dies, that's 50%. And now the family of the one that passed away is fighting with the other owner over what to do with the business. Mm -hmm. It's not usually what people want to, <laughs> they like to set up their business in a way where there's not going to be that issue. You're not going to have to fight with family. Like lawyers, I have to plan that way. I can't leave my law firm to my family because they're not lawyers. They can't practice law. So I need a whole different plan in place, you know, to deal with my staff taking over my firm and owning it if I were to pass away and how they're going to purchase it from my family because they can't operate it. Good point. I mean, good point. Very good point. Well taken. Probably with you too, right? I mean, your family can't just jump in and be a financial advisor unless they've gone through the training. Maybe they are <laughs> advisors, but. <laughs> no, well, even that or, or the, old, the old family restaurant business or the family farm. I mean, how many of those kids, they're working okay. there, but they have other plans and they want to head out of Dodge as soon as mom and dad are gone or what have you, right? Well, that is a really good example of that on the farms and the ranches and the younger generations not wanting to run them anymore. And mom and dad pass away. And the bigger issue too is depending on the age of the children, whether they can afford the taxes on those properties. That's a lot of times why uh, these kids end up selling out to corporations and then big uh, farms and ranch land in Nevada is owned by big corporations then. Yes, and now possibly with um, um, a change of the guard, I, I, I would have it that we might have changes in in tax and estate tax laws, right? That we have yet. To yeah, plan. I mean, there's that's always the potential. That's that's the weird part about planning for estate plans is, you know, you can tell people what the law is at that moment, but 
what what the tax laws are at the moment they die is what's going to become relevant. And so, you know, we have to plan around that somewhat, but we there's always unexpected. But the one thing that's kind of rang true over the years is that having an estate plan and having it structured it is a game plan at least, and it will deal with the taxes the way it needs to deal with it. Okay. But, you know, like the, the ranch land example in rural Nevada, you know, it's that family probably needed to meet with you as a financial advisor to really think about how to pre-plan, you know, sufficient money to pay those taxes into the future if they really wanted it to stay part of the family. Yes. Yeah, I think a term that's thrown about sometimes is big hat, no cattle, when you don't have a bunch enough liquidity to pay those kind of transfer taxes. So very yeah. good. Um, you mentioned about family dynamics. Um, how, how important is it or how do you get the family involved? Number one, maybe having difficult conversations with talking about um, elder care and somebody who does not yet ready to give up their independence, right? Right. Uh, mom and dad, or maybe talking to a young couple about you early in family formation and you're going, no one's anticipating the bad things to happen or preparing people, the kids. Another dilemma is preparing kids for the future wealth that they may inherit from their families, which some people are reluctant to talk about either because it can change their values or, or, or maybe their, their ambitions in life um, or create maybe fighting between family members. Yeah, so that was a loaded question, right? <laughs> There's a lot of parts there. So, you know, the, the elderly that don't wanna give up their independence yet. Uh, you know, you'd be surprised how many people try to claim that uh, the elderly don't have capacity to make their own decisions. Well, just because you can't move around doesn't mean you don't have capacity. Uh, you know, I've got some clients with dementia. We get them evaluated by a doctor who says, yeah, you know, she's got some dementia, but she can still decide where she wants her stuff to go. She has the capacity to make that decision. Um, you know, the, the entire question comes down to undue influence is somebody putting undue influence on that person? If they've got mild form of dementia, then you know a doctor is probably gonna say, well, if it's mild, as long as there's a fiduciary there to make sure she, she or he's not being taken advantage of, then we can get around it, we can work with it. But we use physicians to make, you know, to make that call for us. But um, you know, we see kids bring in their elderly parents all the time because well, they're, you know, their parents are 80 years old and uh, want a divorce. And, <laughs> you know, it's often driven by the kids. It may be driven by stepchildren who want them divorced so that, you know, the inheritance goes the way they want it to go. It, we have to watch out for this stuff a lot. And as divorce attorneys, of course, we're, we're a little hypersensitive to it. We pay attention to whether or not uh, the elderly individual in our office is under undue influence if somebody's trying to uh, force their hand. In terms of family fighting, we tell people that's why planning is the best thing you can do. I mean, it's it, it, the kids might not like it. They might not like how you left things behind, but it's a lot less fighting when you say it will be this than when, they, when you pass away with no estate planning with no documentation about what your desires were and what you wanted. Yeah, um, all tough issues. It's, it's <laughs> right, I, I think maybe we're both in the people business that just happen to deal with law or money, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier about how COVID's changed things this year creating, I don't know, maybe getting in, in your face, this thing of, of our mortality, if you would. Um, you know, are there other, other um, unique challenges of today, maybe from the pandemic, maybe be stress, maybe about businesses changing? Um, yeah, there's a lot, unfortunately. Um, you know, domestic violence is up dramatically. Uh, our estate planning is up dramatic. Uh, that's, again, what I was saying, I think, you know, facing mortality, maybe um, a lot of elderly you know, wake up calls saying, well, I need to plan in case I get sick, in case I get COVID. On the divorce front, a lot of marital stress, people blaming each other, 
for the economy, lack of jobs, um, a lot of custody problems because kids aren't at school full time. We're, we're, <laughs> we're playing out those battles about who gets the kids, when, who can, who's working, who's not. Child support alimony modifications because of people who have lost their jobs. Uh, it's, I, the, the impact is significant. I mean, it's, it's far reaching in my world. Um, what's interesting in my family formation side of things with surrogacy and adoptions, that hasn't slowed down. I mean, and again, it might be facing mortality thing where somebody's going, I need to be a parent. I'm running out of time. Now's the time. I don't know what it is, but it has it, in every way, shape or form, it's affected my business. We see it everywhere. Sounds like it's been pretty contagious in more areas than we thought. Yeah, that's what it sounds like, huh? Right. Well, I wanted to turn the page because I know there's um, there's other things that you've been passionate about. One is, um, one is I wanted to talk about the um, 2015 LBGT Nevada Family Law Initiatives, how it arose, your role, because I mean, you're, you wrote, you're, you know, you've been involved in this, a very groundbreaking thing, and maybe it's impact on Nevadans. Yeah, well, it's, so over the years, I have been lobbying with the Nevada Justice Association. Uh, they fight for individuals, for consumers' rights, and really, they're the only entity in the state of Nevada that fights that good fight. Uh, they have a domestic committee, and really, there's no other organization that lobbies on domestic issues unless they're very specific uh, to domestic violence, for example. Uh, you know, the best example I can give is if you represent a casino and something doesn't go right, they hire a lobbyist for hundreds of thousands of dollars to go change the law for them. You know, an individual in my office getting a divorce or who died uh, with an estate plan that was incomplete, you know, and things don't go right for them within the law, they can't just go hire a lobbyist for hundreds of thousands of dollars to go fix it for them. Right? You don't get divorced and go change the law for yourself. It's too late. It's already impacted you. So my lobbying has been most, it's been in the domestic arena. It's been with Nevada Justice Association. We revamped and rewrote all of the reproductive statutes in Nevada. So um, we've worked on domestic partnerships. We got that passed. I, I gender neutralized every statute in Nevada. I've done all kinds of things that just really to, to widen the scope of who it can impact. So on the family formation end of it, our surrogacy statute used to be, you had to be uh, married, uh, opposite sex intended parents uh, with a sperm and an egg to donate to the process. And now we can use egg donors, sperm donors, embryo donors. Again, it's gender neutral, marital status neutral. Uh, so I can have single intended parents. I can have married, unmarried couples as parents. I, I can pretty much seek parentage for just about anybody at this point. Wow. Now, do people, and has this become a, an area, is, has, is Nevada, you know, where people then come, a destination point for this? How oh, yeah. has this been to other regions, maybe in the United States or even globally? We literally have the best set of laws in the entire world right now for surrogacy. Um, you know, California will try to fight with us for first place on that, but we have a couple of statutes that California is very jealous of, and our insurance is one of them, but, and we just passed that, but the, you know, in terms of how are we globally, yes, people come from all over the world to utilize a surrogate here in Nevada, to use our fertility clinics here in Nevada. Uh, I mean, we are, we're at the top, <laughs> there's no better place to go. So probably 90, 95% of my clients are international clients. What percentage? 90 to 95% of my clients are international. Wow. Right? <laughs> yeah, on mine, you know, my lawyers, they, they're doing domestic work, um, but my reproductive, my surrogacy work, yeah, easily. My clients are all over the world. Well, congratulations. Um, it's fun. It's a good way to practice law. 
but you, you and I talked before we started recording a little bit about, you know, people going to law school and I'm like, don't do it. But in the same breath, I have the best lawyer job anybody could ever have. You know, I, I plan for families. I create families. I, you know, when we do the estate plans, we're just taking them all the way through everything they need to protect their family. I love it, but. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what you're talking about. When I heard you talk about holistic practice, and kind of the soup to nuts, the A to Z. I mean, it, you're an epitome of that. Well, um, we, it's our favorite thing because we don't want to send somebody out the door knowing we didn't do everything we needed to do to help protect them. So, all right. Well, I see that you're also passionate with other um, associations. You mentioned the Nevada Justice Association, so thank you for for that. Um, um, are there are there other associations that you're involved with that? people should know about? Um, yeah, I'm a fellow with the Academy of Adoption and Assisted Reproductive Attorneys. And when you say you're a fellow as a lawyer, it means that you've been vetted. They looked at your caseload. You have sufficient experience, knowledge. They talked references. And so you're vetted to become a fellow. Not just anybody can become one. Um, I became a fellow, gosh, it was a long time ago. I think it was like 2008 or something like that. Uh, one of the first reproductive ones. And, but they're a national organization. They do a lot of good for the, um, to promote surrogacy, to promote reproductive technology. And I'm on, I'm on their board of trustees, not just a fellow. I'm on that board, I'm president of NJA right now. I'm on another board called the Reproductive Alliance. And uh, there's many of them. <laughs> I, I have a problem saying no, Brian. So <laughs> it's, it's a little, I guess stop talking at some point, but. <laughs> well, um, I mean, they, they say the best person to go to is someone who doesn't have time. Right. right? Well, sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, well, kind of speaking about business, and this is this is the one business question I'm going to ask of you because I'm passionate about business ownership and, and what the issues that we have. Um, are there, you know, Michael Gerber, the guy from Emith, writes that you know a lot of us got into business because we're great technicians. You're the best lawyer. You know, I I know how. You know, I should know. I I need to start a business, but very few of us were taught how to run a business. Is there advice? Um, that you might share to our audience on, you know, things that you've learned about running a, a, a law firm? Yeah, it, same problem here. I mean, lawyers don't, at law, in law school, they don't teach you a thing about practicing law. Um, but I'll take it even further. I mean, yes, they don't teach you anything about running a business, but they don't even teach you how to practice law. They really are just jumping right to just the law itself, enough for you to pass the bar. So you come out not knowing how to run a case not you know how to help a client from beginning to end you don't get any of those skills so you know it when you're a business owner i think i don't think i know i've seen a lot of agencies for example pop up in the surrogacy world where the woman was a surrogate once upon a time so she thinks she has you know the she knows how to run an agency but that doesn't mean you have business skills it doesn't mean that you are should be trusted with people's money i'm a, big believer in getting some experience and working for other companies and learn what you don't know. But you see a lot of lawyers walk out of law school and become solo practitioners and hang up their shingle and fail. A lot of them fail. Um, I opened mine. I was a solo for one year before I added another lawyer and then I met four. But uh, it's and I've been open since 2007. And uh, one of the best pieces of advice I got in the beginning was to not be a penny shy and a pound foolish, you know, pay, pay for good help, pay for good staff, pay for good technology. You got to invest in yourself to go to the next stage. And I see tons of lawyers, but also other professionals who just, they're holding off on that investment. Um, but, you know, you make your staff miserable, you make yourself less efficient. And I was, you know, it was the first piece of advice I got. And I had thought about holding off on uh, a paralegal joining me and try to do it on my own for a little bit. And I thought, no, I'm going to take that advice. I'm going to pay for a paralegal immediately. I'm going to get the help I need immediately. 
and we were we were a success immediately quite honestly um, and i'm glad i invested in it it would have been uh, a lot a very long and painful road otherwise well thank you for that sage advice um last question kim it's it's magic time you get a magic wand to change or create whatever it is, write the new chapter. What might that be? <laughs> it, that goes back to, I love my job though. <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't give it up for anything. I wouldn't let anybody have it and I would have it all to myself. <laughs> but I did have to train some opposing counsel because I realized you know, it's hard to have cases when you don't have an attorney on the other side. Um, so I can't have it all to myself or I, I won't be a success again. But uh, I would I make sure my surrogacy work continues to flourish. It, it needs to stay intact. Um, I, I'm blessed. I, I get to spend a lot of time with my son. I have a office environment that I am extremely particular about my staff going home, having their weekends and their nights. And as long as we can sustain that and still pay our bills and uh, be happy and not be miserable or worried about finances, then you know, I would love for COVID to go away. That's my magic wand. There you go, Brian. <laughs> COVID needs to go away. <laughs> That's my perfect world right now. Got it. Well, I mean, those, those, that's good advice about balance. Um, really is, really is. Um, any closing thoughts, Kim? No, just, you know, I encourage people, reach out, do consults, talk to people. You know, the, the stuff we were talking about, the stuff you do also, Brian, is stuff people procrastinate. And I just encourage you just, when you make that first step and you make that first appointment, it's easy after that. Professionals like Brian and I, we can make it work. We can help you and we can make it easier on you. It doesn't have to be miserable, we promise. There it's not a torture chamber. <laughs> we'll get your paperwork done. <laughs> That's cool. Well, I wrote down some summary notes just from listening to you. And there was two P's. One was procrastinate, don't procrastinate. The other one was plan. Um, I loved what you were talking about, about trying to bring harmony in the family and how um, kind of that blood's thicker than water till it comes with money and, 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 and disputes are gonna happen. And how can we smooth these things out? Part of it's planning, but part of it's having a team that you can go to um, um, I also wrote down here about investing in, in investing, you know, in people, in, in your business, um, investing in your future. And the third thing I wrote down was balance is, is having balance in life because, you know, burning the candle on both ends doesn't make anybody happy. And so I, you know, I want to thank you, Kim. I mean, what you've reminded us is that, um, you, you've shared a lot of resources and, and there's a lot of help out there for people that may need it, that, that family law and estate planning go hand in hand, and it's important to have a coordinated team. So, you know, really, I, I want to thank you um, sincerely for joining us today and sharing your thoughts. And, and I want to thank the people for, for joining us today. And we look forward to our next Sage Advice episode. Take care. Thank you.